Praise God. You know, I stand before you this morning as a result of God's grace. Your prayers and modern medical science. I do not pray as often as I should. And neither do you. Don't argue about it. It's a fact. A hard truth. My faith is not as strong as it should be because I do not pray, neither is yours. And your. We do not pray because we do not believe sometimes that God will answer or that God cares. It's a vicious cycle that has swallowed many Christians. Hebrews says that, Hebrews 11.6 says that if you come to God, anyone who comes to God must first believe that he is and that he is a reward of them that diligently seek him. Last year, one of my friends from high school posted on Facebook, he, uh, he's an agnostic. And, and he posted a picture of a tractor trailer with the back doors open. And it was empty. And in the caption he wrote, filled with thoughts and prayers for those in Antigua. Later that year, another friend used the same picture and posted for the people in Puerto Rico after they've been devastated by hurricane. And so I messaged my friend and come to realize, says, you know, this was his rationale. Christians always fast, are always quick to offer thoughts and prayers when tangible things need to be done. And so in the ensuing dialogue between the two of us, it became apparent to me that he did not understand or know the character of God or understand the nature of prayer. But it also taught me that I also don't understand prayer like I think I do. What does the Bible teach about prayer? You know, we, we, we read about prayer. We have seminars on prayer. But we don't often pray. And uh, turn in your Bibles to our scripture reading this morning. Second Chronicles chapter 7 verse 14 through 16 actually. Second Chronicles 7 14 through 16. And before we read God's word, I'm going to pray. Dear Heavenly Father, speak to our hearts. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. It says, If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. Now mine eyes shall be open and my ears attend unto the prayer that is made in this place. Why? For now have I chosen and sanctified this house. That my name may be there forever. And mine eyes and my heart shall be there perpetually. That means forever and ever and ever. Amen. Who is speaking here? Solomon. Not Solomon. The Lord. Christ. You go back up to verse 12. You understand that this is God 
speaking to Solomon. In response to Solomon's prayer of dedication at the temple that he had built for God. And he specifically asked God to hear the prayers made from this temple in regard to forgiveness of sins, justification of the righteous, healing of the land, and he even went as far as to include the stranger, that God would hear the prayers of the stranger. Second Chronicles chapter 6, verses 21 through 42 is where you find uh, this Solomon's prayer request. And in addition to that marvelous prayer that Solomon prayed, Solomon had a party that lasted for 15 days. Well, y'all don't like parties? <laughs> Solomon had a 15-day party for the dedication of God's house. And after all the oxen and sheep, and I mean a lot, you can read it. The innumerable sacrifices of praise and thanksgiving had been offered and accepted. God's glory had filled the temple, and yet God came to Solomon personally by night. To whisper these words in his ear, words of promise and assurance to confirm that God had heard and that he would answer his prayer. And at the heart of this conversation, of this confirmation, is a call to pray. But well, what does it mean to pray? What, what is prayer? I know it's a strange question to ask a church. But what is prayer? All right, all right, all right. Okay, communicating with God. Opening soul to God as a friend. Okay. Opening the heart to God as to a friend. Do you see your hand up, Kenny? Okay. Being real with God. Being real with God. Okay. Communication between God and man. Okay. When we pray, we When we pray, we are communicating with God. Yes? yes? Or we should be. That's true. It is opening the heart to God as to a friend. Uh, Steps to Christ, page 93. Uh, Steps to Christ, page 95 says that uh, that well, it's actually written as a question. And it, it, it reads, I, I have it somewhere in here. It says, oh, why? Let me see. Okay. Why should sons and daughters of God be reluctant to, prayer, to pray when prayer is the key in the hand of faith to unlock heaven's storehouse where are treasures, the boundless resources of omnipotence? Now, this is a journey for me. I can't tell you that this sermon is complete. It's, it's not. But this is just something God has laid on my heart to share with you. And so I hope that at the end, if you get nothing out of this, you at least go home and, and study more what prayers, and then take that biblical model and put it into practice in your daily life. Maybe I should do this backward. Here's what prayer. Here's what prayer is not. Too many of us go to God only concerned about ourselves. 
And that's not the biblical model. Not to say that God is not interested in your life. But this morning we can go look at prayer in the Old Testament. And, and if we, we may get the New Testament, we may not. Then maybe I'll, I'll, I'll get to that another, another time. The Hebrew word for prayer is Strong's number 6419. Kids, if you can see this, you can draw this. It's Palau. I want you to turn in your Bibles to Genesis chapter 20, verse 7. This is the first time the word prayer is used, this word palal. Now you will see, if you look at a concordance, you will see pray, pray. If you look up the word pray, you will see lots of this. Uh, I pray thee. Okay, that is not what we mean. That is uh, like uh, to ask or 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 to to to. Thank you for that good old-fashioned word, beseech. That's not what we're talking about. That's that's a. I don't want to get too too deep. It's a a suffix like it's added to the end of a verb. So you say I pray. You say I pray thee, and then a request for something else. That's not what we're talking about. Genesis twenty verse seven. Somebody found it. Can you read it? Who is talking? God is speaking. So God introduces prayer to us. This concept. And it means. I, I should have told you this. It means. This word means. To judge. Or to. Uh, assess. That's in its regular form. Uh, it also means to intercede or to mediate. It is used 84 times in scripture. And only four times does it mean something other than intercede or mediate. Now what is intercession? A go between. What is the intercessor's role? Does he have, per se, a dog in the fight? No. No. When we are called to pray, we are praying, we're asking God to judge or assess a situation to intercede between that person and that situation for what is his best interest. Chapter 17, church, verse 17 of, of Genesis 20. The same chapter. Read it. Verse so Abraham prayed unto God, and God healed Abimelech and his wife and his maidservant. God said, restore this man, his wife, and he will pray for you. Abraham prayed for him, and what happened? Huh? So here's the first thing I want you to know. We pray to a God who hears and who answers. We pray to a God who hears and who answers. This is why Jesus says, when he's teaching about prayer, do not be like the heathen, using vain repetition to be heard. Think of Mount Carmel. 
What did they pray? Oh, Baal, hear us. Oh, Baal, hear us. Over and over and over again. Our God is not like any other God, brothers and sisters. Amen. And because we pray to a God who hears and who answers, here's the second thing. When we pray, we must expect that he will answer. Jesus tells us to ask in faith, believing that what we have asked for, we have already received. But we ask guessing, amiss. People come to us and ask for prayer for healing and we pray to God like we don't have a clue if he can be, if he can do it we pray for healing with so many qualifiers that God's hands are tied I'm not just talking to you I'm talking to me as well now the next two instances of this verb, prayer, palal, found in the book of Numbers. Numbers chapter 11, verse 2, and Numbers chapter 21, verse 7. So I'll, I'll jot these down so you can take them home. You got Genesis 20, verse 7, Genesis 20, verse 17. Numbers 11.2. When you find it, somebody can read it in your outside voice. And the people cried unto Moses. And when Moses prayed unto the Lord, the fire was quenched. Okay. Numbers 21.7. Somebody else. Yep. Okay, what do you notice in those two situations? Say, interceding, right? Somebody find Exodus chapter 28, verses 29 and 30. It's describing the the high priest and his garment. What does it say? And Aaron shall bear the names of the children of Israel in the breastplate of judgment on mm -hmm. his heart mm -hmm. when he goeth in unto the holy place for a memorial before the Lord continually. And thou shalt put in the breastplate of judgment the Urim What does all of that mean? Intercession. But not just intercession without expectation. Because in the breastplate of the high priest, it says he has the Urim and the Thummim, which were God's yes and no. Right? And the role of the priest was to take before God the care of the people and to go with the expectation that God will give an answer. And he would in turn come to the people and tell them what God has said. You and I are called to be priests, a royal nation. People expect us to pray for them. 
and they expect an answer. And we should expect an answer and be able to give them an answer for the things that we are interceding on their behalf for. Now, Deuteronomy chapter 9, verses 20 and 26. And this is the end of prayer in the Pentateuch. That's it. Deuteronomy chapter 9, verses 20 and 26. Somebody, you can stand up reading your outside voice. Go ahead, Dennis, you found it? And the Lord was very angry with Aaron. Mm -hmm. To have destroyed him, and I prayed for Aaron, also the sin of fire. And I took your sin, the cat which he had made, and burned it with fire, and stamped it, and ground it very small, even until it was small as dust, and I cast the dust thereof into the brook that descended out of the mountain. Verse 26 now. Uh -huh. I prayed therefore unto the Lord and said, O Lord God, destroy not thy people and thy inheritance, which thou hast redeemed through thy greatness, which thou hast brought forth out of Egypt with a mighty hand. Amen. Moses said, I prayed for Aaron. The Lord had sought to do what? When we are called to prayer, the call to prayer is a matter of life and death. And yet we so flippantly say to people, hey, I'll pray for you. And we don't. And God's word is telling us that our prayers are life and death for some people. Even for ourselves. And even not physically, but spiritually. So prayer in the Pentateuch is all about interceding. All right? Turn to 1 Samuel chapter 1, verse 10. First Samuel chapter 1 and verse 10. And somebody else, uh, chapter 2 of Samuel and verse 1. I'll write some other text here on the board. Somebody, go ahead, read 1 Samuel chapter 1, verse 10. And she was in bitterness of soul and prayed unto the Lord and wept sore. Go, read verse 11. C continue. And Uh -huh. And remember me, uh -huh. and not forget thine handmaid, but will give unto thine handmaid a man child. Then I will give him unto the Lord all the days of his life, and there shall no razor came upon his head. Okay. What was, what was the context of that prayer? Hannah. Hannah is praying. Why is she praying? She needs, she is what? Yes. We had somebody this morning who, who has that situation. Yes. She needs a son. She needs a child from God. And it says, she says to God, remember I told you that prayer is not self-centered? What is at the heart of her prayer? If you give this to me, I will give it back to you. When we pray and God blesses us, it is not for us alone. We need to take that blessing that we have asked for and give it back to God. 
What was Samuel to the nation of Israel? He was a leader, school of prophets, right? That mother prayed for that child. And she had that child really for about five years. And she turned him over to the Lord. And he was a blessing to the whole world. Right? First and foremost, to Eli. He was a blessing. Because in Samuel, Eli had a second opportunity to do what he didn't do with his own children. Amen. The things that we have that God has blessed us with are not just for us. Amen. Amen. The gifts and talents we have are not just for us. Amen. But it is for God. For God's will. For God's kingdom. The sufferings. And the difficulties we have. Are not just for us. Amen. We need to stop asking. Why me? And start asking why not me? Amen. Because if God has seen it fit. To allow your body to be afflicted, he will see you through the crisis. Amen. You may not get healed in this life, but God will give you what you need to make it through that crisis. Amen. Let's read Hannah's prayer in uh, chapter 2 and verse 1 of 1 Samuel. You know, one of the things I've struggled with in my life is not saying thank you. When we come to church and we ask for, for prayer, we always have requests. We always got requests. We always some that we want. But we never take the time to say thank you. And it is a difficult thing for us to do because by nature we are self-centered. I want us as a church to stop and smell the roses along the way. Amen. To learn to say thank you to our brothers and sisters for their kindness. To say thank you to God for his mercy and his grace. Listen to Hannah's prayer. And Hannah prayed and said, My heart rejoiceth in the Lord. My horn, my power is exalted in the Lord. My mouth is enlarged over my enemies because I rejoice in in thy salvation. There is none holy as the Lord. There is none beside thee. Neither is there any rock like our God. Talk no more so exceedingly proud. Let not arrogancy come out of your mouth. For the Lord is a God of knowledge. And by him actions are weighed. The bows of mighty men are broken. And they that stumble are girded with strength. They that have hired out themselves for bread, and they that were hungry cease, so that the barren hath borne seven. And she that hath many children is wax feeble. The Lord killeth and maketh a life. He bringeth down to the grave and he bringeth up. The Lord maketh poor and maketh rich. He bringeth low and lifteth up. He raiseth up the poor out of the dust. Lift up the beggar from the dunghill to set, um, set them among the princes and to make them inherit the throne of glory. For the pillars of the earth are the Lord's and he hath set the world upon them. God God is so much bigger than we can think or imagine. Amen. And our prayers are small because our God is small. You know, I, I'm convinced of this. 
My prayer life is stunted because I really don't understand who God is. Tatiana said, prayer is the opening of, heart, of the heart to God is to a friend. Do you have such a friend that you can bear your soul to? And because you may not have such a friend, it's so hard for you to think of God as wanting to be your friend because you know yourself. And God says, I don't care about that stuff. I just want you to bring it to me. Amen. And as he, you bring it to him, he will help you clean it up. Amen. Brothers and sisters, I can't save myself. Amen. I can discipline myself to not do certain things, not eat certain foods. You know, but then I have a hard time getting eight hours of sleep. As many of you nice vegan eating Adventists do. Violate the law of rest. Right? Because those recipes take so long to make, right? Temperance. <laughs> the, but my point is this. We need all of those laws. All of them. We need to eat right. We need to get enough sleep. We need to drink enough water. We need to breathe enough fresh air. We need to trust in God. Amen. Biblical prayer is prayer that is offered with a firm confidence in a God's ability to hear and to perform the thing asked of him. Hannah prayed for a child. God gave her a child. Here's the other area where we fall short. Take your hands. Everybody, so that some of you don't fall asleep. Take your hands, put them on the side of your head. Put them apart a little back. What's that you feel on the side of your head? What do you feel? How many you have? Two ears, right? Two ears. And God says in Revelation, if he that have, how many ears? One ear, at least one. Hear what the Spirit says. In our prayers, we are too fast to speak and too slow to listen. Amen. We come to God and we tell God what we want. And we get up and we assume he heard it. And we don't wait for the answer. That's true. So then we do the thing that we want to do and we tell ourselves, well, I prayed. But we don't go for direction, we go for confirmation because we've already made a decision about what it is we want to do. Now we need to sanctify it, spruce it up. So we would say, the Lord impressed me. And then if you really think about what followed afterwards, you would know that there was no impression from God in that foolishness that we did. How many people here love silence? That's our problem. We are uncomfortable when it gets silent. When I first graduated from college and I went to pastor in Atlanta, one of my church members called me and told me her brother had taken a turn for the worse. And could I get to the hospital? And so I made it to the hospital just ahead of her. And I got there just in time to watch him die. And then everybody in the room looked at me. Because I was supposed to know what to do next. Like I am an expert in death and grieving. 
And I said, Lord, didn't cover this in class. And just so happened that the chaplain passed by and he asked them if they needed help. They said, no, we have our pastor. So our pastor slipped out and asked the chaplain, what do I do? And he says, nothing. You're doing it. What? You are present. To listen. Don't say anything. That was one of the hardest nights I have endured. Because it is so hard for us to listen. And when we come before God in prayer, sometimes we just need to listen. Don't say anything. Mm, yeah. Just come into the presence of God and be quiet. Amen. When you're driving down the road, learn to be quiet. Mm -hmm. Because it is in the stillness of life that we hear God most clearly. So biblical prayer should include a time for us to listen from God. And finally, I give you some verse. Well, I'll tell you what. I'm going to pause some of this stuff. I give it to Brad and he can put it up on the church website or we can print it out for you can have it next week. So in the Old Testament, this idea of prayer is always the idea of intercession, of mediation. It always involves Asking God, what is your opinion on the matter? In the New Testament, when you come to prayer, it, it has a strong word, uh, 4336. You can go home and look that up in your strongs. But the New Testament model of prayer is based on Jesus teaching us how to pray, right? I understand that Jesus introduces prayer into this to us in the against the backdrop of the law. In Matthew chapter 5 and 44, Jesus says, You must pray for those who despitefully use you and persecute you. That is some hard, that's some molar stuff. You gotta already chomp down and grind that through, right? Pray for those who despitefully use you and persecute you. When you know that they're speaking bad about you, pray for them. Jesus says we should, Paul writes and tells we should pray without ceasing. That means that when somebody, the pastor talked about this this week at prayer meeting, you know, when you think of a member from church, pray for them right there and then at that point. You don't know why God put that on your heart. You don't know what they're going through, but believe me, they need that prayer at that time. Amen. And if you learn to pray, to, if you learn to pray for each other, we will also learn to care for each other. Amen. And when we care for each other, the world will know that we are different. I praise God for my neighbors. I got the best neighbors around. The best. Better than yours. Yeah. <laughs> I have the best neighbors around. I have the best friends. I say this. You know, I, my wife was on a plane with my children heading to New York from Barbados. And her ride was... The person who was supposed to pick her up called me 
one hour before they're supposed to land and tell me that they can't come. I'm in Tennessee. They're about to land in New York. And I call one of my friends that we haven't talked for each other like in years. And I call and say, hey, my wife and kids coming in. Don't worry about it. Amen. They were there. God is a friend like that. Bible tells he's a friend that sticks closer than a brother. Amen. Amen. I needed this week to get to the doctor. And I call one of my friends. And technology lost the message somewhere. But he got the message and he called me and said, I just got it. I can take you. He didn't get, he didn't get to take me because my other neighbor took me. See, I told you I had the best neighbors. <laughs> but the point of this is that we have to be willing to inconvenience ourselves because Christ inconvenienced himself to intercede for us. And that is why we need to inconvenience ourselves to intercede for all these people on this side of the board. See, folks, I believe that our church will be different when we become a praying church. Jesus says, when we pray, go into your closet. Don't let your left hand know what your right hand doing. I believe. No, I don't believe. I know. Amen. I know. That our prayers are not effective corporately because we're not praying individually. And what we get when we come here is the sum result of what we do when we are not here. Amen. And I am the chief of offenders. Our church wants to have an evangelistic meeting. When, Ildi? Next August. Next August, we want to have an evangelistic meeting. We need to start praying now. Amen. 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 Pray the first couple of months for yourself and for our church. And then pray that the Lord will help us to go big. We need to build another church. Amen. There are few of us here and there are so many out there. But I can't do it all and you can't do it all. But together, with God, all things are possible. Amen. And so church, I want us to start believing. I want us to start praying and believing that when we pray, God hears, God cares, and God will answer. Amen. So I'm going to invite you at this time. I guess in rows of threes, so... One, two, three, that's one group. One, two, three is another group. We're going to take a moment to pray. So, everybody from my friends in the back to Al, that's one, one group. From Diane to Ruel, that's another group. From Ilde and Rosie to the Ashberries, that's one group. From Dr. Magus down to visiting friends, this is another group. And from Brenda to the end, that's another group. I know how many groups that is. Six, five, maybe. How many? One, two, three, four, five. <sighs> 
1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17. Group 1, in the back. I want you to pray amongst yourselves. Next group, but this. This group over here, number three. From number, from Frankie on back, that'd be Frankie and, and Steve and that group. Uh, for these two, oh, this is, oh, this is four. That's why, you know, see? That's four, that's five. So y'all pray for this and the group at the end. You pray for Ruel. I I know I got two fours because it goes up from here. I, I got yeah. I, thank you. And then when we're done, I'll ask uh, Brother Ildi to offer a, a, a prayer, and then we'll sing. And 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 then I'm going to ask you to commit to something to the Lord. <laughs>